I'm not ashamed. What reasons did Israel have to continue to serve God? This is the question that we seek to answer today as we continue our verse-by-verse study of the book of Joshua on walking through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing Joshua 24, verses 1 to 13. But before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Joshua 24, verse 1. But if you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So Joshua 24, beginning at verse 1. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to possess, But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Also I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. them, Afterward I brought them out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time, and I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you. But I gave them into your hand, that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam, therefore he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves, which you did not plant. We have now come to the final chapter of the book of Joshua. If it seems like we've covered it fast, it's because we did. The chapters are shorter than in some of the other books we've studied, and the narrative moved rather quick, which allowed us to go through it quicker. But we have learned some valuable lessons in this book, and we will learn some more here in chapter 24. It appears that this chapter is a break in the context from chapter 23, for while chapter 23 served as Joshua's final address to Israel, chapter 24 is going to serve as a renewal of the covenant that Israel made with God. If you recall back to Exodus 24, verses 1 to 4 at Mount Sinai, it was there that Israel first made a covenant with God, for it is there that we read, Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. That covenant was made some 75 years earlier with the generation that came before the one that entered the promised land. So with Joshua about to die, it was now an opportune time to draw all of Israel together to renew that covenant so that they could continue serving God. Therefore, Joshua called all of Israel to Shechem. Why Shechem and not Shiloh where the tabernacle was? Well, we don't know for sure. We do know that Shechem has played an important role in Israel's history. It is where Abraham built an altar to the Lord when he first arrived in Canaan in Genesis 12, verse 6. It is where Jacob built an altar to God once he returned from Haran with his family. And of course, near Shechem, between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, is where Israel pronounced the blessings and cursings 
and wrote the law on the whitewashed stones shortly after entering the Promised Land. So this place did have significance, which perhaps gives us the reason that Joshua chose Shechem for this service. We should not assume, however, that the tabernacle or any of its articles were moved here for this service. For once the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh, it ceased from traveling from place to place for different religious services. It wouldn't be until the days of the kings that the tabernacle would move from Shiloh. When all of Israel had assembled before the Lord and Joshua, Joshua expounded to them the reason that they should continue serving the Lord, which centered around God being the God who fulfills promises. Joshua starts with Abraham. When God called Abraham, he was across the Jordan and the Euphrates River in the year of the Chaldees. According to verse 2, we find that all of Abraham's family, including his father Terah, served other gods, the gods of the nations that they lived in. This is not a fact that we found in our study of Genesis. But Abraham had a heart that could be changed, and when Jehovah God called him to go to Canaan, Abraham abandoned his idols and followed the Lord to the land that the Lord would show him. God promised Abraham a son, and God fulfilled that promise through Isaac. God promised Isaac a son, and God provided him too, Esau and Jacob. Esau's descendants received the region of Seir, while Jacob's descendants were sent down into Egypt for a time. But God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that their descendants would inherit Canaan. And so God sent Moses and Aaron in due time to bring Israel up out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea by the power of God, who drowned Pharaoh's army in that same sea. They dwelt in the wilderness for a long time due to rebellion, but then God brought them into the land of the Amorites, and God gave them the land east of the Jordan. When Balak, king of Moab, sent Balaam to curse Israel, God made it so that Balaam could only bless Israel. And then, of course, by the power of God, Israel crossed the Jordan, took Jericho, and then all of the land of Canaan. God had promised Israel this land, a land that they did not labor for, cities that they did not build, and vineyards and olive groves that they did not plant. God fulfilled every one of those promises. Why then would Israel even consider going after other gods, seeing as how those gods did not and could not do any of those things? And the answer is, they shouldn't have. We're going to get Israel's response to all of this, the Lord willing, in the next lesson. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of Joshua 24, verses 14 to 28, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends, so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Amen.